Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, I was just working on a design that included a, an Actel uh, Igloo Nano FPGA, one of the smallest FPGAs on the market, and uh, it also had a Xilinx Spartan 3 FPGA in there as well. And I haven't really done anything on FPGAs before, and everyone's been asking for something, so I thought I'd just uh, cobble together some uh, basic notes, uh, really, just some comments on implementing uh, FPGAs. They're a little bit random. It's not exactly a step-by-step -step thing, but uh, hopefully there's some good stuff in there. How you can just uh, ba take a basic look at the data sheets, uh, what you do at the schematic uh, level to get the FPGA working, and then some layout stuff as well. It's a bit random, but hopefully there's something good in there. It's about an hour long, so hang in there. Okay, we're going to start out here by assuming that we've already picked our device and it's going to be an Actel Igloo Nano part. Uh, it just so happens that uh, for this design we need... Uh, something that is uh, very small, a small number of I.O., a small number of logic, a real small amount, and uh, preferably very low power. And the uh, Actel Igloo Nano pretty much uh, ticks all the boxes there. So let's take a look at the actual data sheet itself. Now, uh, it boasts uh, its nano power consumption, and it, it's a 1.2 volt to 1.5 volt core logic uh, power supply, which is great. The lower the core voltage means the lower power it's going to operate. So, um, so you can, if you can operate from 1.2 to 1.5 volt core voltage, then uh, if you're really after ultra low power, you're going to want to use 1.2. But as you'll see later, there's a trap for young players there. So beware. We'll go into that later. But uh, it uh, also it's a single supply uh, system device as well, which means that the whole chip itself can run off the one voltage. A lot of high-end FPGAs will actually require many, many different um, uh, core voltages for various uh, aspects and functions, but this one can operate off a single voltage, in this case from 1.2 to 1.5, but we'll take a look at that. Um, and we will uh, take a look at the various devices down here. Now, what we need to look through here, this is a this is a parametric device table for all of the Igloo Nano devices in this series from, in this case, uh, system gates here is, is your basic bench line of the part you're going to need. Now, we know for this design that we, in, it's a very small design, we don't need much logic at all. I know it'll definitely fit in the 10,000 uh, system gate design. So, we'll be using today the AGL N. 010 device. Now, it's got uh, the equivalent of uh, 260 watt Actel call, call versatiles, um, but they're effectively uh, basically D flip flops or configurable logic, which we'll look at uh, later. Equivalent macro cells 86 that tries to ha that tries to be a comparison with uh, the competitors like uh, Xilinx and Acro and um, Altera who talk in terms of macro cells in instead of uh, Actel's versatile. So it's very hard to actually translate logic density between the various devices and how many resources you'll need and things like that. That can actually be quite complicated if your uh, if your design is a very tight fit inside your FPGA and uh, it's got a flash freeze mode. Excellent. Two microwatts consumption. Fantastic. Doesn't have any internal uh, RAM at all or any um, fancy uh, clock PLLs or anything like that, but we don't need anything like that. Uh, it's got four what they call VersaNet globals, but uh, globals in FPGAs, what they're talking about there is they're talking about global clocks, and we'll talk about those later. And it's got two different I.O. banks, which uh, for this design might be handy because we want we may want to operate um, the different I.O. banks at different voltages. And we'll take a look at that as well. And look, it comes in, a, uh, it, it only has 34 I.O. I do believe, uh, don't quote me on this, but this could be the um, the smallest FPGA in the industry in terms of uh, size and pin count as well, because FPGAs are basically um, really high pin count and high uh, logic density actual devices. But this is one of the smallest on the market. It's available in the UC36 package, which uh, has its good and bad points, as we'll see. 
And if we go down to here, the IOs per package, here's our part again, and it's uh, available in a UC36 or a QN48. It's the only part which is available in the UC36 package there. The uh, larger logic uh, density devices aren't available in that. And that's a bit of a shame because if you only need a small number of I.O., um, it basically uh, forces you to choose the smallest logic density device. Why can't you have a larger de density device like the AGL N020 in that package? I don't know. Good question. You have to ask Actel slash microsemi. Um, uh, but uh, you'll see that the other devices are basically scale up into larger uh, pin count packages, so you can't get these high density ones in these um, in smaller uh, in smaller packages. You you basically go up in size um, once you meet logic density, and that's pretty standard in the industry, really. And if we take a look down here at the UC36 package that we're going to use, three by three millimeters. It is tiny, nine square millimeters total, <clears throat> and it's got a pin pitch of 0.4 millimeters absolutely tiny and can be a real pain in the ass when you're trying to solder this thing. And here is a good uh, representation telling you what uh, versatile, what you can do with one of these uh, versatiles, each one of those building blocks inside the FPGA. Uh, they're also called macro cells in, in other uh, products and they go under various other names, but you can do, like in this case, a three input lookup table uh, logic thing or you can do a D flip-flop that has uh, an, an actual clocked individually clocked flip-flop which has um, data and clear and once again a more advanced uh, D flip-flop with a separate enable pin and that allows you to do a whole bunch of stuff and you can build up your design based on these basic uh, flip-flops and uh, logic element lookup tables they're very powerful and very versatile as the name goes, versatile. Go figure. Just a quick note with ordering parts here. It actually can be quite complex. This one's relatively easy, but some of the more advanced FPGAs can be a real pain in the ass. And you've got to make sure you order exactly the right part number with the right uh, letters over here like this. If you don't do it, then you'll end up ordering the wrong part from DigiKey or Mouse or someone, and you'll end up with the wrong package or something like that. In, in this case, the first part here is the model number, of course, how many system gates you got. Then you've got this digit here, which it says V2 is 1.2 to 1.5 volt supply. So if you wanted to operate at 1.2 volts and you accidentally ordered the V5 part, oops, it may not work. You might be in big trouble there. Um, and the uh, you've got to order the Z if you want the nano, uh, the the low power nano device. And uh, V this uh, one up here tells you what package type. Um, in this case, we're using the uh, UC um, micro chip scale package, the UC thirty six. Um, but you've got to choose the correct one for your you know for your particular build. Otherwise, you don't want to order the wrong uh, chip. And then. Oop, you can't solder it on your board because you've got the wrong footprint. Oops. Um, and then, of course, you've got uh, lead-free as well and the lead count as well. But really, if you order um, that one, you know, you, you pretty much know you're going to get the right uh, pin counts, pretty obviously. And the temperature range as well. Do you want the industrial or the commercial temperature range? Uh, most of the time, you're just going to want the commercial uh, temperature range. But if you can't actually get that in stock, you can actually order the industrial temperature range. And it just works over a wider temp range. It's even better. Generally, they cost more. But if that's the only one you've got in stock, well, you order that. So just be wary that you order the exact part number you need. And here's the basic internal uh, diagram of what uh, these Actel Igloo FPGAs look like. Now, on the, on the left and right side here, um, we've got the bank I.O. They're actually the I.O. pins. Each one of those little pads there is the I.O. Uh, pin, effectively. And it's got two different banks, bank 0 and bank 1. Now, don't worry about bank 1 at the top here and bank 1 down the bottom. The smaller device we have only has the small number on the sides here. But uh, that allows, having separate I.O. banks like this, allows you to um, uh, operate those I.O. pins at different voltages. So if you're uh, trying to translate, say, on the left side here, if you've got a 2.5 volt uh, I.O. bus coming in, you can translate that into, say, a 3.3 .3 volt 
on the uh, other on the right hand side here to bank zero and that can be very handy uh, and because all actel um, non uh, actel fpgas are all non volatile flash fpgas uh, which is different to the uh, volatile nature of the xilinx and the Altera parts are, you don't need an external configuration prompt, which we'll go into. So that saves up board space, cost, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, it's got the flash freeze technology built in, whatever that does powers it down. And it's got built-in charge pumps to generate the high voltages required for the flash and uh, any other functionality. And uh, these parts in the corner, these uh, CCLs or uh, global clocks, um, the FPGAs will have global clock inputs and they're very you must use those to route if efficiently route your clocks throughout the design i.e in the middle between all these little versatiles and we talked about the versatiles before they're the little logic blocks which are, are used to build up your design inside this fpga but but uh, clocks are very important in any digital design, and you have to feed those into the global clock pins. It's very important. You can feed them into the I.O., but then you get extra delays, and it's got to go through the logic. It uses up extra logic, which could be used for your design, and things like that. So trust me, you want to feed your uh, system clock or other clocks, whatever it is you're working on, uh, into a global clock pin. And then it goes between all of these uh, elements and allows you to more effectively and uh, and uh, route your clocks throughout your design, lower propagation delays, faster uh, faster speeds for your design, and things like that. And if you're really curious to see what's inside one of these versatiles, the actual uh, configurable switching elements in there that make up uh, all that versatility, here it is. Um, this is not in the data sheet. It's in, as with all these FPGAs, it's Everything's not in the one data sheet. They have application handbooks. And in this case, it's the Igloo Nano FPGA Fabric User's Guide. And it tells you all about the FPGA, what's called, they call it the fabric of how the FPGA uh, works and how it's made up. So there you go. Uh, follow that to your heart's content. Knock yourself out. And if you're even keener, you can get into the routing architecture of the FPGA and how you can route between various uh, versatiles and run your clocks and things like that. But uh, generally, unless you're trying to really optimize your design, uh, the FPGA tools will actually uh, take care of this for you. But it's good to have knowledge of how these things uh, actually work and how you can optimize them uh, because it can be the difference between your your uh, actual design in the FPGA operating at 10 megahertz or 20 megahertz, for example, if you don't put the uh, clocks near the I.O. or the banks that you want or things like that. So uh, just be aware that uh, when you're designing with FPGAs, you have to consider, often have to consider a lot of this stuff if you're trying to optimize your designs and you're wondering why you compile it and, uh, oh, it, you know, it's telling me it only works at 10 megahertz and I wanted the thing to work at 20. Oops. So there's lots of things to uh, consider. Uh, it can be a good read to actually uh, sit through and read these manuals. Now here's a part of the data sheet you really want to take notice of. This, the basic recommended operating conditions for the various pins. So down in this uh, left hand column down here we've got our uh, pins. VJTAG, VPUMP and VCC pins and IO pins and all sorts of things. And uh, what specs they operate at. Now. Let's take a look at our um, intended device here is our 1.2 to 1.5 volt um, power supply. Our VCC power supply core voltage can operate, sure enough, as it says, from 1.2 uh, to uh, basically 1.2 to 1.5. It's got a bit of margin uh, there either side, but they're the basic operating things as you'd expect. Now, the voltage for the JTAG pin, which we'll take a look at later, uh, it can be in the range from 1.4 volts to 3.6 volts. Fantastic. Okay. Now, our V-pump uh, programming voltage, okay, during operation can be anywhere from 3.0 to 3.6 volts because it doesn't care when the device is just operating. It's probably not, uh, it's not really used at all. But during programming mode, here's a bit of a trap. 3.15 to 3.45 or 3.3 volts are uh, your standard 3.3 volts that's what it needs during programming mode now you remember back at the start we said this device was a single supply voltage chip 
Now, in, in that, in theory, everything can run off the one supply voltage, or in this case, say 1.5 volts. Well, that's true during operation, but during programming, you can't operate this thing at 1.5 volts. You have to operate, you ha that pin has to be 3.3 volts. So it's not really, during programming mode, a true uh, single supply device because you can't operate the core voltage at 3.3 volts. You have to have a voltage regulator on there from 1.5. Well, what's, what's the big deal, I hear you ask? Well, that means that you've got to put extra uh, DC to DC converters on your board to cater for this stuff and that adds to your bill of materials, your cost, your board space, everything. So just be wary of that. It can be really annoying. Now, uh, VCC PLL, our chip does not have an internal phase lock loop, which is what a PLL is. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. But if we did, if we use one of the higher end uh, Actel Igloo devices, we would care about that. And once again, it's from 1.2 to 1.5, uh, it must, the PLL must run at 1.5, 1 1.2 to 1.5 volts. It can't run off 3.3 or anything else. And our uh, VCC IO pins, uh, they can operate anywhere from 1.2 volts to 3.3 volts. So that means that this device is not what's called a 5 volt uh, TTL capable um, interface device. So if you were looking at interfacing uh, 5 volt TTL signals to this, this FPGA, you can't do it. You would need a voltage level translator. So that's a bit of a trap. Don't assume that all FPGAs are 5 volt capable because they aren't. Now, something even more important than looking at your basic recommended operating conditions is looking at these little numbers here. See these little uh, asterisks there? Look, notes, little note numbers. In this case, the VCC core note number four and five. Let's go down and take a look at what this has to say down in the fine print, shall we? It's printed under the table here, often in much finer print than what's here. So number four, for Igloo uh, V2 uh, nano device only operating, eh, we don't care too much about that. But look, number five here, real trap for young players. It says the Igloo Nano V5 devices can be programmed with the VCC core voltage at 1.5 volts only. Igloo Nano V2 devices can be programmed with the core voltage at 1.2 with the Flash Pro 4 unit only, or 1.5 volts. Oh, if you're using the older Flash Pro 3 unit and want to do in-system programming using 1.2 volts, please contact the factory. Now, what this means is that you can be left um, up the creek without a paddle if you uh, if you connected your core voltage, your VCC core voltage to 1.2 volts as they claimed all the way back on the front page of the data sheet. They said it could operate at 1.2 volts and it can, but it cannot be programmed at 1.2 volts. You have to have the VCC core voltage at 1.5 volts during programming. And it also tells you this, it highlights this in the Flash Pro 4, which is the in-circuit JTAG um, serial serial programmer for this uh, for the Actel Igloo devices. It tells you that in the fine print in that user guide as well. So just be careful. Don't believe everything you read on the front page specs of the data sheet. And yet another thing to consider, calculating power dissipation Beware of the figures that they use. That uh, 2 microwatt uh, consumption figure for the flash freeze mode, that's assuming uh, these conditions and various other things. Sleep, shutdown, no flash freeze. Here's a table of the power supply configurations where the specs are valid. And then it goes into quiescent uh, currents during flash freeze mode. And then you've got quiescent uh, uh, currents per I.O. banks and things like this. It can get really complicated and this is a very very simple FPGA and here's an interesting figure the dynamic uh, power consumption in terms of microwatts per megahertz uh, for, for various um, IO uh, input uh, buffer power and things like that it wow you know it can get quite complicated and here's a more device specific dynamic 
power consumption figures for the for various uh, combinations of these. You'd have to go and check out the uh, user guides to figure out what all these means. The clock contribution to the versatile used in a, as a sequential module is going to have, um, well, in this case for our design, 0.143 microwatts per megahertz. Oh, it can get bloody complicated. Good thing that they a lot of the manufacturers have um, uh, power dynamic uh, power consumption um, estimate calculators to do a lot of this uh, stuff for you. But often you'll have to go in here manually to do ballpark calculations of um, uh, how much power your actual design, your compiled design, is going to take at a specific frequency. And we haven't even scratched the surface there. Can be very complicated stuff, and this is not a complicated FPGA. But look at all this stuff you got to read. Oh my goodness! Well, enough of that uh, data sheet business. Let's actually uh, do a schematic and see uh, the basic uh, things we have to do to get a functional FPGA design up and running for something like this uh, very simple Actel Igloo. This is as simple as it gets. So uh, don't think other FPGAs are this easy. Trust me, they're not, okay, as we might look at. Now, uh, you'll see that I've placed the part here, and before anyone asks what package am I using, it's Altium Designer, okay? No more needs to be said. Now, uh, we have to the two different banks. Now, it separates uh, Bank 0 and Bank 1 into two specific uh, banks, and the reason it does this is because down here, in this one here, You'll notice that there's a separate VCC pin for VCC um, input for bank 0, B0 there, VCC in for input for uh, bank 1. So you have a different power supply voltage, so this B0 pin, C5 there, powers the IO pins on this bank. The other pin, D2 there, powers IO on bank number one. So if you were doing a voltage translation design, as we mentioned before, and you say you want to have a bunch of I.O. and you wanted to bring them all into this um, bank zero, and you wanted to operate that at, say, uh, 1.8 volts or something like that, you would tie C5 to 1.8 volts. And if you wanted 3.3 volts output, you would put all your uh, output pins or your other I.O. pins on to bank one here and then power bank one from uh, 3.3 volts. So you can uh, generally, that's just a very versatile, but in most designs, you'll generally be operating from a single power supply voltage. So in that case, you might say put both of those pins to 3.3 volts. Now, um, I'll copy this over into a working design and uh, see what we have. Now, on these banks here, these each I.O. pin is capable of not only I.O., but lots of other stuff as well. And they will generally, um, in the, in the uh, pinouts for the device, they will tell you, and some of these pins can have four, five, or six different functions on them. They can be incredible. Now, in this case, because we've got a very simple FPGA here, um, only a couple of these pins have different purposes. You'll see that uh, pin A4 right up the top here is uh, GDC zero or uh, global clock zero and once again you can go in and figure out what these things mean there's lots of lots of obscure names and they change from manufacturer to manufacturer but generally if you see the uh, the term uh, G there you can uh, generally sniff out that that is a global clock pin and that can be very very important uh, as we'll talk about now down here um, well, as you can see, there's other pins in bank one, another two global clock pins down here, plus the FF pin. If you go to the data sheet, that's the flash freeze pin. So uh, if you want to enable the flash freeze functionality, say you wanted to have a switch on your board or controlled from other circuitry, then you wouldn't be, you may not be able to use that I.O. pin. You might lose that pin for the flash freeze functionality. And once again, for the global clocks, you can either use them as I.O. or clock input. In this case, you might want to use your main oscillator might be fed into global clock zero here. And in, in that case, you would lose uh, one of those I.O. pins for that functionality. 
Another major thing that you're going to have to deal with is the JTAG programming interface. Now, because this is a Flash-based device, uh, we don't have an external PROM here, which I'll show you another um, example of a uh, Xilinx part that needs that external Flash PROM. But in this case, we can hook our JTAG program programming uh, in-circuit system header header connector here directly up to the JTAG pins on the FPGA. And there's five pins here which you need to hook up. These are a JTAG uh, standard. JTAG stands for uh, Joint Test Action Group. And JTAG was originally originally designed for uh, in-circuit um, testing and boundary testing of the I.O. pins of the device. So after you've assembled your board, you hook up JTAG and you can actually test that there's no shorts on the output or something like that. Um, but, but really, it's uh, morphed into like a generic programming interface for the device. So this is how you program uh, your, um, your design project into the flash into the Actel device itself. It's via this JTAG interface. Now, um, this... It will the header you use will totally depend on the JTAG programmer you're actually using. Uh, in this case, we're using a uh, Flash Pro 4. That's what this pinout's for, and that that's an Actel. That's uh, that's the genuine Actel Flash programmer. But you can use others on the market if you so desire, and they may have different pinouts. So make sure you get it right, and don't confuse TDI and TDO uh, input and output and things like that. Now, you can actually uh, daisy chain devices together. So if you've got more than one FPGA, you can actually um, daisy chain the input and output pins. And you can have basically as many FPGAs or other devices on that one JTAG uh, serial bus. And next, we've got the various uh, core and I.O. voltages and the JTAG and the voltage pump uh, things. Now, we've mentioned that the uh, different banks can have different I.O. voltages. In this case, I've got them both the same at 3.3 volts. But I could go in there and change that to, say, uh, 2.5 volts if you supply 2.5 volts or 1.8 or any other core voltage you want. And, of course, you're going to want a bypass capacitor on each of those voltage pins. Now sometimes, because this is a very tiny device, we've only got one pin, but sometimes you might get four, five, or or even more pins um, for that one uh, voltage bank, and they all have to be tied to the same voltage, and uh, preferably, um, maybe, potentially even very high speed devines, designs, um, you may have to individually decouple those pins as well and we'll go into that when we lay out the board but uh, for most generic designs especially on a small package like this you you know you're going to get away with just well you will because um, there's only one pin you just need the one bypass cap per pin or you could even tie them together and possibly get away with just one bypass cap for both pins but it depends on the location of your bypass cap if you're using ground planes what speed is your design all, all that signal integrity stuff, all that nasty stuff um, that uh, is, you know, really hard to know unless, uh, really hard to uh, model even. Uh, you really have to know what you're doing. But don't let that scare you, okay? A bypass cap uh, per pin like that is going to do the business no problem whatsoever. And over here, we've got D3 and D4. They're two uh, VCC pins. Once again, bigger FPGA. You might have a dozen VCC pins you have to tie, a dozen core voltage pins. But in this case, we're happy with just that one. Now, um, because we've got two pins, I'll use two bypass caps on there. I'll mix it up a bit. I'll put a 100N and a 1 microfarad on there just for a bit of extra capacitance um, on the main core. Uh, generally, uh, you will want that you've got to be careful, uh, especially on, say, the uh, Xilinx devices and big um, non-flash-based devices. They can have very large uh, startup currents when you when they actually program the thing at startup, and you need a lot of uh, bypass capacitance, a lot of bulk capacitance there to actually handle the charge. But once again, don't let it scare you. Don't get buried in the details there. And uh, we want to power this from 1.2 to 1.5. I've actually got, because this is a prototype board, I've actually got a core, a core voltage select header here. So we can actually program the thing. You can move a jumper across, program it at 1.5 volts, and then put it down to 1.2 volts. But if you were designing this into a more intelligent um, uh, system, then uh, you would maybe have a uh, FET in there or something to control your DC to DC converter, which select automatically selected the voltage during programming. And actually, 
Yeah, that's what this uh, pin, this unused pin four up here, up on the JTAG adapter, is designed for exactly that purpose. It's designed for driving a MOSFET, which then can control the output voltage of your DC to DC converter during during the JTAG programming mode and then so it switches up to 1.5 during programming and then down to the minimum 1.2 during operation of your device so that you can draw the minimum amount of power consumption or if you didn't want to worry about all that crap you just tie the thing to 1.5 volts no worries now uh, the JTAG pin here this is the voltage that uh, you want for your JTAG interface so this E6 pin here actually controls the IO voltage on your JTAG interface here. Now generally most good uh, JTAG ad adapters can handle any voltage and that's why I fed back a sense line going all the way around here back to here. It'll have a voltage sense input so the uh, in-circuit programmer knows what voltage is being used. It can sense it and then uh, handle the IO translation accordingly to drive the chip at the correct voltage. Whew, it's too hard. And uh, in a specific case of the Actels, it requires a V pump voltage down here on the E4 pin, and that is supplied directly from the JTAG programming adapter. And you can read all about this uh, typical interface. It gives you example circuits in the um, in the data sheet for the JTAG programming adapter. In this case, the Pro, uh, the Flash Pro 4. And down here, we've got two extra pins which are the ground pins, once again, just time to ground. They must both be tied to ground. More advanced FPGAs might have 20 or 100 ground pins. I'm not kidding you. And just on the power supply aspect, if you're powering your design from, say, a 5-volt plug pack or any other voltage plug pack or some other supply, then uh, you're going to need a couple of voltage regulators. In this case, you're going to need a 3.3-volt uh, voltage regulator for the I.O. if you're using it at that. Uh, generally, you will be. Um, unless your entire system runs at uh, 1.5 volts, then, well, you can get away with just this 1.5 volt voltage regulator. Now, as we talked about, this is where you may want to include that uh, FET in here to change the value of R28 here to change the output voltage between 1.5 volts and 1.2 volts. If you wanted to get tricky and, uh, just, and, and actually minimize your power consumption by operating your FPGA, at 1.2 volts. So this is where you would uh, do that in your DC to DC converter here. I've done it as a jumper because it's just a prototype um, board. But yeah, if you want to get fancy, uh, some uh, larger FPGAs can require three, four, or even half a dozen different IO voltage for IO voltages for a typical design. It's crazy. You might have five volts. You might have some uh, five volt logic stuff. You might have 3.3 volts. You might need uh, 2.5 volts um, for some uh, phase lock loop stuff. You might need 1.5 volts. You might need 1.2 volts. You might need 1.8 volts for some other logic. You can get crazy. You get carried away. Even a basic design. A lot of chips, uh, a lot of more advanced chips these days might only work at, say, 1.8. Well, in that case, you're screwed. You've got to add another 1.8 volt voltage regulator to your design. And that's something to think about up front when you're actually designing uh, your board, especially if you've got uh, uh, size constraints or budget constraints or something like that. You don't want to be including half a dozen voltage regulators. And FPGAs, of course, aren't magic. They don't have any internal uh, clocks that are of any use to your design, uh, generally. So, really, uh, your, for your system to work, you're going to want to supply an external clock from either an oscillator, like we are in this case. Here we go. We've got a 3.3-volt uh, uh, oscillator here, a standard packaged oscillator with its own uh, bypass cap there. And uh, it might be, say, 20 megahertz for a typical uh, a general FPGA uh, system, something like this. And you'll notice, we've mentioned, we're feeding it into a global clock pin. This is very important because um, if you feed it, as we said, if you feed into one of these I.O. pins up here, which you can do because they are general purpose I.O., um, and you can route those through to other parts of your design, but it's very inefficient in terms of uh, layout. It's very slow in terms of system speed. And there's some, uh, in fact, there's some versatility which you can't get unless you feed the system clock into a global clock pin. Very, very important. Make sure you get it right. Otherwise, you'll wonder why you hit the compile button on your uh, 
on your FPGA design and it says, sorry, I can't do that, or, uh, or your design only operates at one megahertz. Tough titties. Now, just as a bonus, I'm going to show you a different design here that uh, doesn't use an act 2 glue part. It uses a Xilinx Spartan 3 part, and it's the um, Spartan um, XC3S 250E device dash uh, 4VQ100C. So it's in a 100-pin uh, quad flat pack package, which is really quite uh, usable, really easy to uh, solder package. Now, this is not a high-end FPGA at all. Um, in this case, it's only got uh, four uh, banks. And, um, you know, it's it's a pretty, uh, not not super low-end like the Igloo uh, we were looking at before, but uh, it's certainly not a uh, high-end FPGA device, that's for sure. It's quite uh, cheap and simple. But once again, look at these. We've got the same thing happening here. We've got the different banks. And you'll notice some of the things we saw before. We need a system clock, like we just mentioned, but it's got some weird stuff. What's this H-swap thing? Well, you'll have to go to the data sheet to find out, won't you? Look at this G clock. 11 there on pin 91. All these G all these global clocks. Uh -huh. We've mentioned those before. VREF, what's that? You'll have to go to the data sheet to find out. This lowly pin, pin 92 here, it doesn't do much else. It's pretty boring. It's only got one generic I.O. And uh, look at these other uh, things here. Some of these pins are what's called uh, I.O. L.O. 5P. And once again, same thing, I.O. L.O. 5N, positive and negative. That indicates that this is a differential. You can actually use these as differential um, I.O., not just standard single-ended, um, you know, 3.3 or 1.5 volt. IO. They can be differential. You can configure them in lots of uh, weird and unusual ways. Poor old 92 there does nothing. They uh, they shortchange that poor sucker. And take a look at bank number one here. We've got some other mysterious stuff. What's this RH clock? Well, that stands for right hand clock. And uh, that literally means the right hand part of the chip, uh, of, of the physical die itself. And if you want to know, what all that and, and what that actually means, you'll have to go read the Xilinx data sheet for this device and the app notes and the configuration. What's this CSO? Look, pin 24, what's that do? Init B. Mm, why have I got that init B pin tied high to 3.3? Well, there's a reason. And it goes all the way down here and it goes into the, uh, the output enable and reset pin of a Xilinx FPGA configuration device. Hmm. Time to look at the data sheet for that, which we won't go into. We don't have time. But um, because this Xilinx uh, Spartan 3 part is a is not a flash-based part like the Igloo, it is a RAM-based part, it needs a separate chip. This is actually a separate uh, configuration chip here. And in fact, I think it's a one point uh, it, it's a one megabit um, in circuit um, serial configuration flash. Prom. So this external chip is what actually holds your program. And when you power up your board, the FPGA is blank. It's dumb. It doesn't know what to do. And it has to sit there and wait until some internal circuitry in the FPGA, in this case it does have its own clocks and things like that for this specific purpose, it actually um, loads in uh, the configuration program which you've stored in your configuration prom here. And... Once again, what's this little note I've got here? FPGA configuration. It's in what's called master mode serial. And if you want to know what that is, you'll have to look at the Xilinx FPGA data sheet. But you've got to know this stuff because if you don't get it right, um, then, you'll, uh, then you'll build up your board and wonder why it just doesn't boot up. It doesn't load your program and things don't work. And if you're a beginner, it can be a real pain in the ass. Um, but we're using master serial mode, which means you've got to tie... These pins, M M0, M1, and M2, to low. And if you go up here and have a squeeze around here, look, there's the M1 pin combined with an I.O. pin. So you lose an I.O. pin, we've got to tie that to ground. M0 there, um, and M2 is uh, down, I don't know, somewhere down here. Your guess is as good as mine. It's there somewhere. There it is, M2 in that device there, pin 39. You've got to tie those low to put it into a boot configuration mode that talks to this prom. It can get even more complicated than that if you want to program your device via an external micro or something like that. Crazy. What's all this uh, What's this IP stuff? More VREF things, read-write pins, all sorts of stuff. It can get very complicated. It's crazy. 
And uh, once again, this will be fairly familiar to you, to you. It'll it's the JTAG pins, the JTAG interface pins on the FPGA TDI TDO. Now in this case, it's actually it's hard to look at the configuration here, but this external PROM is actually in series with the uh, TDI and TDO lines um, on the JTAG interface. In this case, we're using the Xilinx Zy um, 14 pin uh, JTAG interface. And once again, they've got example app notes of how to actually configure these devices and stuff like that. But uh, just be aware that this is the complexity you've got to go to just to start up, just to boot this particular Xilinx Spartan 3 FPGA. What a pain in the ass. Now, um, as per the Actel Igloo, we've fed our system clock here, our system clock. You would feed it into one of these global clock pins. Look at them. There's at least 11 of them. There's a lot. But in this case, I've fed it in all the way down here, which is pin 40, which is the global clock 2. Um, in this case, it really doesn't matter, or it shouldn't matter, which global clock I put that into. Uh, but double check that in the data sheet, because there might be a small trap there. Not all models of FPGA are the same, even if they're from the same manufacturer. Now, here's an interesting one. I'm actually using the, um, this particular design actually has the Altium JTAG interface as well. And it's got what's called a uh, soft JTAG interface. Um, now, you'll notice that the uh, soft, that the, what's called the soft T-clock pin here, don't worry about the details, but it's basically a clock pin. Now, uh, that... I, because it's a clock pin and uh, I want it to operate, be fairly efficient and operate at fast speeds, I've ensured that the clock pin here actually goes into pin 32, a global clock pin. So just be careful if you're, um, it, same if you've got say an SPI bus or something like that and you want it to operate really quickly. Well, the clock pin, um, you might want, well, you might want to hook up to a global clock pin. Uh, just just be wary of that or if you've got some other uh, clock based system very important and that's why these FPGAs have so many global clock pins it just allows you to um, uh, do really complex uh, clocked really complex designs with multiple system clocks and things like that and what sort of power supply voltages does this device need well I'm glad you asked. In this case of the uh, Xilinx Spartan 3, I'm using, um, once again, different banks. Here we go, the VCC O Bank 0, Bank 1, Bank 2, Bank 3. I've tied them all to 3.3 volts because it's not a multi-voltage um, interface uh, interface design, this one. I've only used two bypass uh, caps because uh, this is not a particularly high-speed design, but if it was, you might want to have um, bypass pins on even every one of those pins if you really uh, have to. So, because these pins are spread out a lot, look, and pin 82 is not next to pin 97 on the actual chip, right? It's not right next to it. If it was, then you could get away with the one bypass cap, but they've actually spread those pins um, for, for speed reasons and all sorts of other really tricky stuff. They've actually spread those pins apart on the device, and you'll notice none of them are next to each other. So, um, you know, really high speed designs, you might want a bypass cap for each one of those pins. It can get really annoying. Now, we've got what's called VCC aux over here. Um, that's for auxiliary uh, stuff with inside the FPGA. Read the data sheet if you want to know more, but it must be 2.5 volts. This is the only thing in my design that needs 2.5 volts. How annoying. I've got to now have a separate voltage regulator up here. This one has four. 3.3, 2.5, 1.5, and 1.2 volts. Ah, oh, how annoying! Because the not only do we need 2.5 volts for the um, auxiliary up here, but we need 1.2 volts for the core. It doesn't operate at 3.3 uh, or 2.5. So bingo, we've just increased our system cost and complexity again by adding extra voltage regulators there. And once again, you might want to bypass each of those uh, pins. I'm I'm going to get away with just two bypass. Uh, pins for each group of four power pins there and once again it has a whole bunch of uh, ground uh, pins on the device which you'll typically want to tie uh, directly down to your uh, down to some sort of ground plane on your bottom layer or an internal layer for a multi-layer design especially if you've got BGA devices all right let's take a look at the Actel igloo part here on a real 
FPGA. This is a fairly small board. It's only 50 millimeters by 33 millimeters. Couple of 0.1 inch headers here. There's the uh, JTAG interface down here. 0.1 inch um, dual row pin header down there. Pretty standard, but look at the size of this chip here and a couple of 0603 surface mount uh, bypass caps. Let's take a look at the chip. It is absolutely tiny. And uh, if we have a look at the uh, 3D view here, you can see that the FPGA itself is only three millimeters by three millimeters. And it really is not much bigger than, than the footprints of the two 0603 bypass capacitors here. Absolutely crazy. It's uh, That's how small this device um, actually is. It's one of the, uh, I think it is the smallest FPGA on the market, but uh, I mean, we can go for smaller uh, bypass uh, caps there, of course, but um, really, you know, it depends on the design you want to do. This is a prototype, so I'm going to use 0603. Now, the device, as we've mentioned, is a uh, 0.4 millimeter pin pitch, so it's 0.4 millimeters between each one of those pins. Now, this is a um, this is a standard uh, footprint for this uh, for this particular BGA device. It's 36 pins. You can see the tiny little pads in there. Now, um, the first thing you're going to want to do when you put this down is to figure out how you're actually going to uh, route out or what's called fan out the pins on this device. And that is dependent upon whether you're using a uh, double-sided board or you're using a multi-layer board. Now, I'm going to put this on a double-sided board and I've decided to actually uh, completely fan out the device on the one layer. And I can do this because it's only effectively uh, two layers deep on the outer um, pads to get down to the core down here. Now, these are uh, traces because, um, well, FPGA, when you're fanning out these sort of things, there's a whole trade-off between uh, how many layers PCB you're going to need when you're fanning out these BGA type devices as opposed to a quad flat pack or something like that which has all the pins around the outside and you can just uh, route them out really easily but because this is a BGA device a ball grid array real pain in the ass and uh, this is why it's a massive trade-off um, between your ability to route out the traces and the minimum trace width these traces I've got here they're only 0.1 millimeters or uh, just on four thou uh, width and a lot of PC, a lot of the cheap PCB manufacturers will not be able to do four thou traces. If you want to go to, um, you know, or, or you'll have to pay more for that technology. So even though we've instantly, um, we're, we're using as basically as smaller, um, we're using a four thou tr track and space as it's called in between here, then. Uh, really, we have to uh, pay a manufacturer who's capable of manufacturing a what's called a 4-4 um, spec board, 4th hour trace, 4th hour clearance. And that doesn't include any vias at all on this design. Now, I've got some vias up here. Now, they might look uh, like typical vias, but take into account that my grid space in here is 0.1 millimeters. Okay, each one of these grids and this via here is a hole size, a drill hole size of 0.1 millimeters. It's ridiculously small and it's got a pad diameter of 0.2 millimeters. This is really, um, you know, that's quite leading edge stuff. Uh, you would be very hard pressed to get um, anyone to do anything under this one here, which is a 0.3 millimeter uh, hole size or a, and a 0.4 millimeter pad. Now, generally you wouldn't do that because um, you would want to include a bigger ratio between the via hole size and the pad size. So you might want to increase that to say 0.5 millimeters like that. So you don't get what's called a uh, via breakout. So the drill is not always aligned perfectly and it, you don't want it to break out the pad. So you've got to um, take into account what your PCB manufacturer specifies in their uh, tolerance there. But that's a 0.3 millimeters, which for general boards, you would not want to go below 0.3 millimeter drill size. Trust me, uh, you, you get, you're in for a lot of expense and, um, and special costing. Now, this is a 0.4 millimeter via size here, but um, I would typically use on a dense 
surface mount board, I'll typically, my standard via will be 0.3 millimeters like this one. Now, if I try and drag that via under this chip, and <laughs> you can see, because it's only a 0.4 millimeter pin pitch, I can't use a 0.3 millimeter via under there. It's impossible. I can't even use a 0.2 two millimeter oh maybe i could get away with a 0.2 millimeter via if i reduced the um solder mast expansion which we've got here but we'll talk about that in a second if i want to uh actually uh, fan out this fpga on different layers with vias i'm gonna have to use a 0.1 millimeter drill size maybe i can get away with 0.2 but it's just crazy now um, solder mask, as I was showing in my soldering tutorials, is very, very important here. Look, you can see that tiny sliver down there. The manufacturer is not going to be able to manufacture that. Okay, there'll be no solder mask left. We've actually got a what's called a solder mask expansion here of uh, 0.05 millimeters or two mil or two thou. Okay, that is a very small uh, solder mask expansion. On a general board, you might use say. 4 thou, but because this is a very dense uh, chip, which, by the way, this chip drives this entire design, okay? You might have through-hole parts on the rest of your board, big through-hole parts, massive uh, pin pitches. You can use 20 thou tracks, 20 thou space, but because you've decided to use this little tiny pissant FPGA in this pain-in-the-ass uh, 0.4 millimeter pin pitch BGA package, Bingo! Instantly, your uh, to get your PCB manufactured, manufactured, you've got to go down to at least four four thou rules. Or if you wanted to route out individual vias on different layers, say this was a four layer board and you wanted to use the you know, uh, drop through to the bottom layer to route out some of those pins, well, you've got to use a tiny little drill size like that. Now, I could actually um, change my solder mask expansion if the manufacturer uh, actually could actually do this. I could change it down to say one thou like that, and you'll see it change. And in this case, I might be able to get away with a uh, 0.2 millimeter, <laughs> maybe. But look at the solder mask expansion there; it's bugger all. So you don't want your paste uh, when you solder this in your solder paste to short out to your via, and you would want what you would want what is called a tented via. So you'd want to go in there, and you'd want to force tenting onto those vias like that so that uh, uh, there is no solder mask expansion so when you uh, flip to the 3d view you'll actually uh, see the difference there so if i drag say two vias in here like this i've got my 0.1 millimeter one here my 0.2 millimeter this one has uh, tenting on the top of the via top and the bottom so uh, if we go into 3d view here you'll see You'll notice that uh, it's, 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 this is what uh, one of the things 3D mode is really great for because it can actually show you the, uh, the real solder mask expansion on the board and what it's actually going to look like. In this case, it's a blue solder mask and you can see the individual pads there and the solder mask expansion. Once again, remember, we've only got a very tiny, very tight tolerance, one thou solder mask expansion on those pads. The manufacturer is going to choke when they hear that. They're going to charge you a crap load of money if they're actually able to do that at all. But as you can see, this one here, this uh, 0.2 millimeter hole here, doesn't matter if it's 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters, what the size is, but because it's uh, forced tenting on top of those, then um, there is no chance of uh, paste, when you uh, manufacture your board, you'll lay down some solder paste, no chance of it shorting to the via next to it. But look at this one here. It's tiny, and that distance in there is only going to be less than 0.1 millimeters. It's tiny. So if you accidentally get some solder bridging across there, you're in deep trouble if you've applied too much solder paste. So really, when you're doing high-density uh, BGA boards like this, make sure that you uh, tent your vias, and you may actually have to plug them too. You may have to get the manufacturer to what's called plug it, and they actually put a little uh, resin or something in, inside to plug the hole first so that the solder mask truly does uh, cover it. But when you're talking about like a 0.1 uh, millimeter hole like this one, which is insanely small, it's almost a micro uh, via um, size, really. So, um, uh, 
generally, if we go back in, I've just start uh, tented that one. There you go. It's uh, it's tented. Just make sure you tent or plug them. Otherwise, you could end up with massive shorts under there, and you won't be able to inspect it, of course, and you won't know until you to until you go and actually uh, power up your prototype, and it could actually even go bang. If you accidentally short out uh, ground and power, poof, release the magic smoke. Oops. Now, I got a little bit uh, sidetracked there talking about all that sort of stuff, but we're talking about fanning out this FPGA, either using vias or uh, tracers. Now, because this is only two layers, two pin layers deep, I'm actually able to get one trace out there. I can't get tr two, really, because we're already down to 4 thou, or 0.1 millimeter track width. But uh, sometimes on some FPGAs, especially on the larger uh, pin pitch ones, you can actually get two tracks out between one individual uh, pin. Now, if this FPGA was any bigger, we would not be able to route out uh, the extra tracks here. We'd be forced to use some vias here to drop through to our other layers. Bingo, we've instantly uh, meant that we have to um, get 0.1 or 0.2 millimeter drill hole boards, much more expensive, pain in the ass. But anyway, um, I figured out a way to uh, route or fan out this device um, uh, based on, and uh, just based on a single layer here. So uh, if you'll notice each quadrant of the FPGA like this is basically a rotational mirror image of the one up here. Well, it's not quite, but it's uh, close. Sort of this one matches that. This quadrant matches the diagonal quadrant over there and uh, so on. And uh, and really, it, it is quite a nice symmetrical rotational design. I like it. Brings a bit of a tear to the eye, really. Um, so we've routed out uh, these using 4 thou traces okay let's switch to imperial mode because i like to use imperial not metric mode for my uh, traces but for hole sizes and board sizes and things like that i use metric go figure um but uh, yeah that's just the way the a lot of the industry works the pcb industry does mix up their uh their millimeters and their thous quite a lot um but you have to generally juggle both when you're doing a pcb design like this anyway um, this means that we can um, sort of start fanning out um, these using larger traces. We might uh, say go to a six thou trace or something like that when we um, take that because you don't want to use a four thou trace all over your board. So you might just fan it out with those small uh, four thou traces or you could even uh, say fan it out with say an eight thou trace perhaps. You might be able to get away with that but just watch your clearances in there. Um, if you don't have enough space, there we go. We might, yeah, that's probably going to be enough space in there. So we could fan this out with an eight with eight millimeter traces, no problems at all. So there you go. That is um, basically uh, laying out a or fanning out a a uh, FPGA, a 0.4 millimeter pitch BGA device. Really. If you can avoid it, uh, using these type of packages and these devices, do it. Because it can be uh, really expensive and a real pain in the butt. And uh, likewise, uh, we're trying to get our bypass caps here close to our uh, close to our power pins in here. So you drag it all the way over here and then you might have, say, a, uh, a wire in here like this, okay? Dropping it down to a... Um, dropping it down to, you know, a power tracer on, on a different layer. But look, this is a 0.3 millimeter via, which is the um which is the minimum size I would be comfortable with on on a basic board like this without uh, paying a lot more. Some people would even say 0.4 millimeters is too small. Okay, but once I get in there, you can see that routing out these becomes a bit of a pain. And then I've got to move my cap in here and uh, it just it gets really quite ugly really quickly, uh, especially if you've got a lot of bypass caps on a design like this. Now, a lot of um, FPGA designs, especially some more advanced ones, will actually, um, the bypass caps will be directly under the chip on the bottom layer, uh, the bottom side of the board, and what's called a um, what's called a two-sided load uh, components on both sides of the board. So you can get a very low inductance path between your pad. Like if your vias here like this, okay, I might swap my... Um, I might swap my component down to the bottom layer down there. Okay, it's now flipped over to the bottom, and I might sit that on the bottom 
like that, okay? So I can actually get, if this was a huge device, like a massive, big, you know, four, 500 or a thousand pin BGA device, I'd put that bypass cap on the bottom there and bingo, it's disappeared. You'll find that it's actually vanished onto the bottom side of the board right next to the via that uh, allows me to get a low inductance path through to that bottom layer. But there you go. There's uh, FPGAs for you. I hope you found that interesting. And really, this was a very basic implementation, a very low, the lowest end FPGA you can get. And there's actually a lot of factors I didn't cover. So please don't leave comments saying I left out this, I left out that. It's designed to be food for thought, thought and uh, hopefully you learn something. But go check the data sheets. Don't be scared of these sorts of devices. Just be aware that there's lots of traps for young players, a lot of things which drive your design decisions for FPGA, not only on the schematic and the component level, but on the PCB level as well. Hope you liked it. I'll see you next time. And don't forget to subscribe and uh, rate and uh, do all and comment and all that sort of stuff, even if it's a flame comment. I don't mind, really. See ya.